the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. Learn about the most current IT security threats in ransomware, phishing, business email compromise, cyber crime tactics, cyber heist schemes, social engineering scams, as well as hints and tips from leading professionals to help you prevent hackers from penetrating your network and dropping ransomware or malware payloads. This podcast will arm you with the best info to defend your network against the latest cyber crimes. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And now, here's your host, Craig Petronella. Welcome, everyone, to another PTG podcast. Uh, unfortunately, Craig is not here with us today. He's super busy, but it, we do have myself and BJ. It's the last day of March in 2022. Yeah, last right. day. Tomorrow's April Fool's Day. <laughs> is it, though, or are you just messing with me? Yeah, Hard how dare Craig be busy? It's not like there's cyber fires all over the world. <laughs> yeah, cool. there's no cyber anything. Yeah, it's not right like now. it's like taking every news headline these days. <laughs> Speaking of news headlines, so I thought, BJ, the one that we were talking about early is, pr- well, actually, pretty much everything that we talk about is interesting, <laughs> but this one it goes along with my whole saying that hackers have no shame it does not they will use a tragedy to their advantage just like any sort of sociopath out there and i think actually it might be even worse because if if this was occurring in real life it would maybe be harder for some people but i feel like because it's through the computer and they don't see the person yeah it allows them it does it it empowers the the one let's just use the term sociopath right because you know, that's kind of what it fits, right? That's the mold it fits when you're just attacking people for no reason that don't deserve your harm. So when you think of it that way, a sociopath in real life has to worry about being seen, being caught, being facing an adversary yeah. that's more strong than they are. So not wanting to attack. But when you do this, these things, when you take a sociopath and put them in a cyber space, then they become, they feel really empowered because they don't have to worry about some of those things that they worry about in real life. So then you have an outlet for an extreme type of sociopath. That's like a suppressed sociopath, right? Cause in real life they can't do their sociopathic activities. So they've suppressed them. And so cyberspace gives them a whole new outlet and that's a dangerous situation. So people really, this is eye opening, right? This is a really, this is a good lesson learned like that headline that you brought up that hackers are exploiting the situation in ukraine with you with phishing attempts like galore and stuff like from a psychological perspective because we know that when you consider hacking and cybercrime, you have to consider the actual event and you have to consider the psychology of it, just like they use social engineering for their attacks. You have to do the same. You have to put a mirror there and look at the hackers from that same viewpoint. This is eye-opening for people that feel like, oh, it's not going to happen to me or, oh, cyberspace is not as dangerous as people act like it is and there's not the threats aren't as real as they act like they are or anything like that. Consider the fact that they're exploiting ruthlessly and without conscious, it seems conscience, it seems conscious, it seems the tragedy of others. They're exploiting it and using it for a, a launching pad for cyber attacks. And these people don't deserve their harm, but they're doing it anyway. And well, so and that would be really eye opening. Yeah. And another thing too, is that, like I was saying, so I don't think all these people would even necessarily be sociopaths, but they're able to dissociate from the people because they don't have contact with them. So even if a person's not like a full-fledged sociopath, they maybe can find any sort of excuse that they can come up with to, so if these, if there's Russian hackers that are, are doing this to people, yeah. they can be like, oh, I'm doing it for Mother Russia. <laughs> yeah, because people don't, all humans are probably made up of the same potential for different types of behaviors and mindsets, but it's a matter of which one you choose to resonate with and you, know, you choose to exemplify. But people don't usually do their dirt out in broad daylight. They usually do it under the cover of darkness. And so that's the danger with cyberspace because it's a cover of dark. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it, it enables that that part of hu- of the human psyche, right? That is willing to do dirt. Like you hear about horror stories from the deep web and stuff, because that part of the psyche that is willing to do the dirt has a place in cyberspace. Exactly. And I think too, I think this is important for listeners to hear too, and something to take to- Just take note of. So if you receive anything, there's actually, according to Google's, and I'll link this in the description, but according to Google's Threat Analysis Group or TAG, 
one actor is impersonating military personnel to extort money for rescuing relatives in Ukraine. That's just disgusting. That's that's just. And it says that over the past two weeks, TAG has observed three particularly active criminal groups trying to monetize the war in Ukraine. So just be careful, it, especially if something is this like heartfelt sob story. Just don't buy. Like, just do don't click research. on. Don't, and, don't, don't click, click on anything. On anything. <laughs> you did not ask for an email. Yeah. You get an IM if there's a post. Even a post. yeah, even if you did, I'm not gonna name the eye doctor because this can happen to anyone. But listen. Even if, like I had an experience where I had a legitimate appointment with an eye doctor, but I received a correspondence for an appointment that was not my correct time. So somehow someone became privy to the information that I was a oh. client or a patient and that I had called or had was on their books somewhere. And then I was fished. I, a phishing attempt came with a link to click on. And I normally would have thought, oh, this is fine to click on because I legitimately had an appointment with this eye doctor. But no, it wasn't the right link. It, it wasn't It wasn't good. So it's just, and that's a hard reality to face because we don't want to live in a world like that where you can't even click on something your eye doctor sends you, even though you have an appointment, because that's that's just like, ew, that's just such a yuck world. But listen, that's where we are right now. <laughs> that doesn't mean that's where we'll be a year from now, but that's where we are right now. So right now we have to take caution. And right now it's best to err on the side of caution and just don't click. It's quite apparent that this is not sustainable. This type of an environment is not sustainable. So obviously there's high hopes for what can emerge from cybersecurity and even from a quantum cybersecurity perspective where there's not just telemetry, which is normal cybersecurity, but depth perception in the telemetry, where things can get really interesting as far as AI's ability to track and monitor and analyze and categorize threats correctly. That possibility is on the horizon. But in the meantime, no click is de definitely the best route. Yes, exactly. Don't click. When in doubt, don't click. <laughs> and make sure you hover. <laughs> hover over the link to see if it's a real link. And don't use the link that they send you. So if, for example, with your eye doctor, right? So if you get a link from or a message from your eye doctor and it's click here to review your appointment and they give you the wrong appointment, like time, that could be, they could know that it's the wrong time and then they're just trying to bait you with it. Right. That's a good idea. Yeah. That is a good idea. Like, wait, that's not my appointment. Let me yeah, check Yeah. So I better this. click and correct this. Yeah. Because they, we're talking about psychology in hacking and that's, believe me, that's what they do also. They consider how will a normal person react in a situation like this? And they prey upon that information and they use it against us. And so it's very important to consider the psychological aspect. And they probably do split testing. Like Craig is real big on split testing. And as he should be, any company is good. It's good to experiment and see which works the best. And you better believe these hackers are doing the same thing. Yeah. So if they're yeah. if they're inside that computer, like they know the date and time oh, yeah. of, of your appointment. Yeah. So maybe they're like, let me try this. Let me just tweak this a yep. little bit and see what reaction yep. I can get. And, and, you, and people don't understand that with everything... Every good thing has its shadow that emerges and technology is wonderful for humanity that the doors that's opening for us are remarkable. There's also a flip side to that. Yeah. So obviously they're using malware in an automated fashion. And we used to think that when it came to phishing emails, we could sort them like there was a, usually a red flag because when you got an email and it wasn't in correct English, right? That used to be a red flag that everyone pretty much, you know, collectively identified as a red flag. That's not necessarily the case anymore because there are a lot of AI driven writing tools that can be used. And it, I've seen um, a definite reduction in the amount of identifiable language barrier issues, definite reduction lately. So that's, we can't use our old intelligence and think that it's going to stay that way because as good things evolve, so does the shadow, right? Yeah, exactly. Anything can be taken advantage of. And that's, yeah. I guess, the slippery slope fallacy, a lot of people call it. But the thing is, is that you do have to think about these things. Yeah. It's like any anything that can be positive can usually be turned right. into a negative, unfortunately. Right. just the So the more of us that band together and decide that we want to have a secure cyberspace, it's just like we want to have a good world free of war and a peaceful place and stuff. The more of us that are in agreement about these things, the less 
momentum flows to the bad guys, the bad actors. It's There's only so much momentum available in the world, right? And so the more of us that take that momentum and use it for good, the less likely that, that these negatives are very sustainable. Exactly. And you're going to, I just saw something else. So I was on that other um, site and I got more cybersecurity news about Russia. So oh. this is Russia's a mess, man. All right. So it says Russian Aviation Authority switches to paper after losing 65 TVs. Oh, boy. I should say a whole lot. <laughs> a lot of data. They suffered a major cyber attack on Saturday. Wow. This whole situation is a ticking time bomb of its own. Wow. It's, yeah. I mean, wow. it's crazy right. that it's still going on right now. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. Like, I remember my boyfriend was like, and his, was, we're talking to his dad about it, who's real big on history. He's a history pro- professor. And they're like, this is going to be over in two days. By the weekend, I think it started on Thursday or something. Yeah. And it's like, this is going to be over. And the fact that it's not, it's crazy. Well, there's just, oh, it's so complicated. The world is a complicated place, isn't it? Just like cyberspace is, so is the world. Because, God, how do we, there's just so much out there. And there's news outlets. And who knows what's. There's so many question marks. There's so many question marks everywhere. On to places where there's no question marks, right? Where there's no question marks is phenomenon of the cosmic kind, right? There are no question marks there. So factual information that is outside of the ability of humankind to manipulate is the fact that there are a lot of solar flares going on these days. So this is important from a cybersecurity perspective because so the sun is just now entering a new cycle. It's new 11 year cycle. But at this transition time of the 11-year cycle, it's a very important time. The last time we were in this type of of a transition of cycles was a major solar flare, like major. And it it affected technology big time. Now technology being so much more advanced, the impact it would make now, we have so much more in place than we did in the 50s that now the effect would be who knows what, like huge. There's been a lot of solar flares lately, and they're really gaining momentum. So one sunspot alone let off 17 flares the other day. Two coronal mass injections, which is like a whole new category, uh, not new, it's a whole different category, because these are like eruptions of particles, like charged particles that are leaving the sun and into space. And they can, usually the magnetic field of earth will prevent them from really interacting much with us. But we know there's been anomalies in the magnetic field as well. Two of these CMEs are supposedly hitting earth today, ironically, and they're meeting each other in space because of the difference in speed of the CME. So they're meeting each other. Well, it's very important, as Craig has talked about before, to have an even power supply for your devices, especially if you're a business that has a big network, right, with a lot of IoT connected devices, it's very important to have an even power supply. And so that's a a UPS device, right? So critical. So two parts to this, because of the activity, and now not only are we seeing an increase in solar flares, the quantity and the magnitude, now we're seeing some new, not new again, it's happened before, but I guess it's not happened recently, solar tsunamis. And this is this week as well. There's a lot going on with the sun. So so having a UPS device right now is becoming very, it's always been important because uneven power can affect your network in a lot of ways. It can also damage your devices because your devices need, it's imagine like your human heart. Do you want it to spike up and down like drastically or do you want it to be more even? So the same thing for your devices, like you want to try to give a more even power supply the life of your device can be affected by uneven power supplies. So two parts to this, it's definitely factual that the sun is becoming very active. So with that in mind, UPS devices are very important. Along those lines, so is the configuration of your UPS device, because we saw an article about a large number of UPS devices being remotely hacked into, unfortunately. So UPS devices, definitely look into them at this time configure them correctly and make sure you have appropriate cybersecurity in place uh, because that's just another, it's very important to have, but it is another pathway for bad actors to attempt to access your network. And what's interesting too, there's, I shared this story with you was it this summer about the solar flares or the, the video on it. Uh-huh. Where the solar flares actually caused a voting discrepancy. Oh <laughs> yeah. It was like, it was somewhere in Europe, maybe Poland, I could be wrong about the details, but basically a solar flare hit and it caused a switch in the voting thing to switch from like I to O 
Like, yeah, oh, that, that can happen often where the, the one yeah, zero it, switch happens. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. So because of that, it caused um, it add an added an additional four thousand votes to be cast. Yeah. It was in a place where there weren't even four thousand voters. Right, right. They're like, what is this? And the only thing they could think of it was something with the numbers and the where it switched and it caused it caused yeah well the moral of the story here guys is that the solar flares can absolutely affect things on earth we learned that back in the 50s when a solar flare that was so big it was called the carrington event but it was so big that machines were running on electrified air they had to be unplugged from power supply because oh, wow. Arched. yes they were yes they were charged by the electrified air and so their being plugged into a power supply was overload of power and so they had to be unplugged and even unplugged, they were working. So this is a whole, now we're in a whole new age because they didn't have, depending on how you want to look at it, AI has always been around to a certain degree, but now it's really becoming more, it's to a much higher degree these days. We're in a different time now than we were in the fifties. Who knows if a big enough solar flare were to hit, machines start operating without needing to be plugged into <laughs> to power. We've got a whole new set of question marks and it could be good ones it could be like we couldn't shift from like shadowy question marks to like golden question marks like that that would be a good thing but so note to self everyone solar flares can absolutely impact what happens on earth they can absolutely impact your machinery and your equipment look into a ups supply and by all means look into if you need help configuring it get with a, a cyber expert that can help get it configured correctly because the last thing you want to do is try to protect your network and devices and actually you know open it to new vulnerabilities because it's crazy like even airplanes um and spaceships especially spaceships like they're uh -huh. blasting past the the atmosphere so they're not protected oh, yeah. as protected so there's more of a chance of something hitting the switch flipping it over and causing so they have redundancy, uh, multiple redundancies set up yeah. in, in the ships and on the airplanes because it can it yeah. could literally die. Oh, yeah. We lose sight of the fact that a, the human species is still dependent on nature and phenomenon of nature. We lose sight of that because we have we have so many advancements in modern. We have we have like houses and cars and airplanes. And, and so sometimes we start to feel detached from the natural environment, like the sun, the moon, the stars, the air, things like that. But right. these types, yeah, exactly. We feel like we can just do whatever we want to it and it's going to be okay. These types of situations that we find ourselves in now with a sun that's very active right now. And it's ironic because we're actually in a period where it would be expected to be inactive because we're, we're in, the, in this possible grand solar minimum time, but it's becoming very active. So uh, we're definitely in odd times from a solar perspective. But that reminds us that we are still very attached to that natural background, that natu mm -hmm. those natural phenomena. We are not removed from those. As I shared with you, I heard a mathematician and I thought it was brilliant. I never heard this analogy before, but he said, I can't, I, I would cite him if I could remember his name, but I don't remember it. But he said, he said that a computer is basically lightning in a rock. <laughs> and if you think of what is the computer made of, it's made of natural products that, that they need to source from the earth, different materials. And what power is it? It's some type of what makes it process, what makes it spin and process. Like it's some type of active force that's available, readily available in the cosmos. We didn't create that active force. It's just readily available to be tapped into. Internet message was sent. Yes, someone created the framework to send those messages, but they did not create the fact that the message could be sent upon this signal. That signal was not created. That signal has always been. And we're getting reminded of our attachment to the natural background in events like this with this very active sun that we're now seeing. Your technology is definitely not separate from that. That's a good reminder for everyone that your technology is not separate from the natural universe. It's actually, it's actually very much a part of it. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's also one thing, this might sound a little crazy, but I feel like I've said this a couple of times and I have not seen Avatar, so I, I don't know, like people are like, oh, like Avatar. But if you think about it, the internet is really just almost mirroring like the mycelium network in a way. I feel like it's more, we can't see it. Like we can't see the internet. We can't, it's not like with the mycelium network and we see the root. Well, it's this, yeah, it's this, it's look at a, a strike of lightning. Have you ever seen it? Like picture that as the internet. It's just, that's what the mycelium network is. It's the 1.618, right? That goes throughout all creation. 
but it's there and the internet signal we don't see. But listen, when they sent that first message, right back in, there's debate on who supposedly started the internet or created it, but whoever sent the first message, we, there's debate on when that first message was successfully sent, but whoever sent it, they had knowledge of this signal that was available to send messages on. They didn't invent the signal, nor did they create it. They just had awareness of the signal's existence. And then they figured out a way to build upon that signal. But it's good. It's a good time for us all to remember that signal was there. We discovered it, but we didn't create it. And it's still there. And we still use it every day in our computing. And we haven't been aware of it. And so we should be aware of it at this time because that signal is doing, it's experiencing some anomalies. So that's a good time to really pay attention. Sorry, Blake is messaging me. I'm trying to get him. He might join. I'm not really sure. But a UPS for my home, honestly, because I never really took it seriously. Craig's always been preaching about UPS. Like he, he's actually really a authority on the figure on the topic because he I, has identified for companies before that actually an uneven power supply was the source of their problems with their technology behaving. If their technology didn't always work right or it just it didn't function the way it was supposed to, he a lot of time was able to pinpoint the problem to uneven power supply. Oh, really? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. He's written a lot of articles on UPS and the need for UPS because of uneven, excuse me, uneven power supply. A lot of times it could be a root problem if the network, no matter how good your equipment is and how good your networking team is and your IT architects and all, if you don't have an even power supply, if it's getting shoddy power and sometimes it's getting a burst that's way too high and then sometimes it's getting a I'm lag crying. that's not nearly enough. Yeah. It's, it's uneven. If you're going to, if you're going to flat iron your hair, do you want it to go 500 degrees and, and then 20 degrees, or do you want it to stay even? (laughs) It doesn't matter how pretty your equipment is and how well you network your stuff together. If it doesn't have an even power supply, it's going to be sporadic and it's not going to behave properly. No, that's a really good point. Yeah. Because we forget about the, we forget about the backbone of the internet, which is that signal itself. And it does, it is connected to power of the cosmic kind, solar flares, solar winds, all these things affect the way our technology operates. Right. And a lot of times we take it for granted too. Yeah. But it's even there. Hey, Blake. Oh, you're on mute. Hey. How's it going? How are you feeling? Gosh, it's busy. Oh yeah. We're... No, we started a little while ago. I just wasn't sure when you were able to join. So. No, no, I, sorry. That's okay. How dare you work? No. <laughs> Come to work and actually do work and help clients. <laughs> what are you thinking? Now, we don't just do. We don't just sit around and do podcasts and talk about cybersecurity all day. <laughs> yeah, I think I got some new projects for us. Oh, that's exciting! Hopefully. I always like new projects. Yeah. <laughs> Blake, yeah, have you ever seen, because you, your background is, you're just a technical guy all the way around, but have you ever witnessed yourself personally? We were just talking about uneven power supply because Craig's always been a real big, he's, I picture him as like a, a power supply evangelist. Like he's always mm-hmm. talking, he, he had experiences before with companies having problems with their equipment and their technology not working. And he pinpointed it to power supply problems, uneven power supply. Have you ever seen anything for, in your experience where power supply has definitely affected the way a network functions properly? Um, not a network, but obviously power draws a lot to do with everything electronic. So for example, in my world, in my real world, I bought it. When I bought an Xbox, I lost the power cord when I moved and there was like a, a special type of Xbox core that is required because it has to draw a certain amount of power from the outlet and Uh harness that power in a way that the Xbox uses it. The other plug worked and it plugged into the machine and it was designed for the same type of port. But over a certain period of time, apparently from my understanding, the Xbox would just cease to work. Yeah, I've experienced that. Like I've, how, you get, you, how you get when you get a new phone, especially like a nice phone, it comes with a, a special cord for that phone. And then I, like everyone else probably has, has had something happen and had to run out and get a replacement cord. And sometimes we've hit up the Dollar Tree or the dollar store and they have a little Mm -hmm. $5 cords. And I've done that myself, but I've definitely noticed that doing that has then brought on issues with the device after, before too long. Yeah. I I started upgrading my life and started using like a USB-C adapter. Mm -hmm. So like it's a, it's a wall outlet to a USB-C 
and then a USB-C to a, an iPhone, like a lightning charger, because that charges the phone like 10 times faster. Like, yeah. no joke. Versus hmm. a normal USB-A. So I can charge ask, my phone. Is it 10 times faster? Why? Because of the power draw for USB-C. So it's able to supply more watts. Probably um, must be a cleaner power too, then, if it can do that. Yeah. Also think about this from the Apple world. If you buy a 15 inch MacBook or a larger display laptop, they give you a larger power supply. Versus if you buy a smaller laptop, a smaller power supply. Same thing with iPads and iPhones. So yeah. if you buy an iPad, they give you a little bit larger power supply versus if you buy an iPhone, they give you no power supply at this point. But anyways, it's able to pull and push more power. So I can charge my phone. I've got a battery pack on my phone. That's like a, an Apple designed like double battery life. It gives me about 48 hours of battery capability, like, like oh, video wow. ca- streaming capabilities. I don't know. It never came up. But anyways, now I can charge. I, it charges them both at the same time. So it'll charge one battery. It'll charge the next one. I can, I can get 48 hours of battery from both devices. It takes probably about three hours to charge them both entirely wow that is a really interesting point like because we don't think about how different devices do have different power cords and power boxes because they require different types of power different levels of power and i never thought about that until you said that and i think about my wearable tech that i use like i have smart glasses i have smart watches they use a different a different power supply altogether. If I look at my glasses, they have a four, it's like a, it's not, it doesn't plug in. It it attaches to the frames and it's four dots, like four gold dots and they attach to four gold lines. And so obviously it needs like a, maybe a smaller current of power, but spread to the right areas maybe. And the same thing with my smartwatch, it has four four circle dots around a circle that just plugs to the back, like like attaches to the back of the wash. It just magnetizes onto it. Yeah. Yeah. Think about this too, like even abroad, right? So like everybody, I don't know if you guys, if you guys have traveled abroad, there's different travel adapters. Yeah. Like for example, in the UK, they have different outlets. In Europe, they have different outlets. In New Zealand, they have different outlets. They have Austra- in, in Australia, they have di- different outlets. I and mean, of course, in the States. And those all supply different amp- amps or wattages. That's the reason why travel adapters with surge protectors exist. You're able to convert a 240 pro. I'm not like, please don't quote me on this. But like a 240, I think it's 240 watt, 240 volt device to 140 volt outlet or something like that. So, sorry guys, that was my, I don't know how to silence my watch yet. <laughs> You'll get there. Yeah. That's fun. Like even with the, with my microphone, I don't know when I got the new microphone, the, it's like an it's extra special USB cord of some sort. I'm not sure all the details, but I would I accidentally plug, use the wrong cord thinking it was the right cord, but it, my microphone wasn't working because it just wasn't getting the right amount of power to it, which I thought was like. Yeah. And if you can hear that sound in the background, that's my refrigerator. So yeah, I think I need a UPS for my house. I think I'm going to look into getting one at home. That's the surge protector? Yeah. Yeah. The, for uneven power supply so that it regulates your power like a, you know, like picture like a conductor of an opera or something. Like it's regulating power and sending the right amount of power to the right, to keeping your everything level power and not avoiding the bursts and the dips. Not only does it distribute power, but it also, some UPSs have uh, backup battery capabilities. Oh, really? So if, for example, you have a certain watt backup battery, let's just say, for example, you have a computer that's drawing 140 watt hours and you have a backup battery that's designed with, for easy math, a thousand watt hours, hundred. You, you would literally be able to use your computer or charge your computer. The math gets really funky, but let's just say you had a constant draw of 100 watts and you had a 1,000 watt backup battery, 100 watts per hour, you'd be able to use that device for 10 hours. Oh, that's a a big deal in an emergency situation. That's what a lot of like IT, like whenever we go on site, I mean, they have a server rack. There's always on the rack, there's always a backup battery. And yeah, it's designed to keep the servers running for as long as possible. 
So that way there's no interruptions at all. And usually they're designed for anywhere from five to seven hours. Seven hours would be an extreme outage. Seven plus hours would be an extreme outage. So we're usually designed to keep the servers running for at least seven hours. Wow. That's pretty interesting. So that, that that's a very eye-opening. And we really need to start looking at the power supply. We, we jump, if we're guilty of, of, as a species, we're always guilty of rushing to the reward and not, not diligently traveling the journey. We, we love our convenience of our devices, but let's not neglect the power that, that powers these devices and, and keeping that power clean and keeping that power um, level and regulated and all that. That's very important. So yeah, I think a lot about those. Have you seen those new solar phone chargers that are like, little, uh, they're a little backup? Uh, yeah, maybe five years or so. But yeah, so you set it in the sunlight and it charges up uh, and then you can run your device and charge your device from it. And then whenever the battery dies, you just put it in the sun again. Yeah, we need to get we need to get some solar batteries for our, our boat. We don't, we don't have any on our boat right now, but those are really helpful. So that's a, that's a good. That's good advice for our listeners too, to start just thinking about what your power supply is and how, how, like we talk about fiber hygiene, power hygiene as well, making sure that you're paying attention to the, what the actual foundational layer of, of the internet, the backbone, the, the power itself that, that powers all these devices. It can be annoying, yeah. obviously, to have to reset stuff, you know, like your devices, your hair dryer that, that always has a, a reset button. Not that I use one because my hair is already too big, but it can be annoying to figure it out. Once you realize what it's for, it, it's going to keep that yeah. device from frying or blowing up your, not blowing up your house necessarily. But what was it that caused the fire, John, the fire that Jonathan had to put out? Was it something with the uneven power source? Well, he had, yeah, he put, no, he forgot to flip the switch. Something was set to receive a certain amount of power. And he didn't flip the switch and he kept it at that same amount. And then it got up. It, uh, so yeah, it was, that's exactly what it was. It was a burst of power that was too strong. Yeah, Aaron, exactly. I, I said no, but then as I explained it, I was like, wait a minute, that's exactly what I'm explaining. It's, really, it's not exactly what I was talking about, but it, it didn't yeah. happen by accident. It was user error, but because Jonathan didn't flip the switch and tell it to bring less power in, it, it brought, it let too much current in and that current absolutely set the device on fire. <laughs> Like and literally, he, it can burn a whole house down if you don't yeah. have the proper... Hey, oh my goodness. Like, how many house fires are there? And they don't know how they start sometimes. Like, they call it an electrical fire. There's a reason it started. And it sometimes is it a burst of power that's too high for a certain device. And then it, Jonathan was holding this device in his hands. And it received too big of a, a current of power. And it literally burst into flames in a data wow. center. So, yeah, it can happen. We need, really need yeah. to get Jonathan on the podcast yeah. at some point to tell that story. Yeah. Well, we've went pretty long. Maybe that was a good one, though. That was a that very useful information. It's eye-opening. Even in our position, like, I'm thinking, I, I really need to look at a power supply for my smart home. <laughs> yeah, you really, it's, everybody should. Yeah, get one and make sure it's properly configured and you have your cyber hygiene in place because everything that's connected to power is also a, it's also a, a vector it's a place where it's a pathway so right but yeah i think that's a good place to wrap up thank you blake for for jumping on i know you're busy um but it's good to have a technical perspective so we appreciate it and sure. uh, also everyone don't forget to join us live on mondays we're gonna we're gonna switch it to just doing live broadcasts on mondays and we have a fantastic guest on Monday. We're really oh, excited yeah. for her. She works for Prevail, which is one of our trusted vendors that we use. And she eats, sleeps, breathes compliance. Any questions about CMMC? She has a great story. Her story is, is amazing. It? No, it's just Noelle. She just joined them, I think she said a couple months ago. Yeah, she's got lots of experience with the well, Yeah, like um, in yeah. tech. Yeah, and IT. And she's just great she was a breath of fresh air like she really was it was just nice talking to her so i'm I'm really excited about having her on there and she'll she'll give a lot of great information yep yep yeah so don't forget to like our youtube channel too that'd be really great if you do that like and subscribe and all right you guys have a good one and we'll talk soon all All right right. thanks for listening to the Cybersecurity and compliance podcast with craig petronella for other episodes and more information visit PetronellaTech.com. Also visit our other websites, ComplianceArmor.com and BlockchainSecurity.com. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening and stay secure.